Welcome back everybody to the Real Estate Money School. I'm your host, Chris Noggle, and I've got a special guest today. A guest straight out of LA, a hotbed for real estate. And not only that, his story is gonna be a really cool one because he came from Nebraska, then he went to California, and then a little something happened, and he landed in California. So we're gonna talk a lot about real estate. We're gonna talk a lot about Blake, his story to what he's done to success and what he's seeing in the markets. I think one of the main things we're gonna discuss in today's episode of the podcast is really the market environment. What's going on? Since COVID, the world's been flipped upside down. You know, we call it the big pivot. You can call it whatever you want, but it's just crazy what's going on out there. The markets are hotter than they've ever been. The question is, when does that bubble burst? And that's what we're going to get into. But before we get into Blake and his story, let's talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a Rebel Banker. That journey always begins with you taking action on knowledge. Now, we always get knowledge. You're on here listening, maybe for entertainment, maybe to learn something new, but don't stop there because knowledge is not power. You know what it is? Taking action on knowledge. Now, that's the real power and that's what you need to do. So grab a copy of my book, The Private Money Guide, and you know what? I'll give it to you for free. So this is a challenge. This is not an option. I want you to have this book and you want it for free. All you need to do is go to my website, chrisnoggle.com forward slash resources, or just click the resources tab, scroll down and click the book and it's free to you. You just pay the shipping. And then I'll double up on that one just to make it a little bit better because I want you taking action on things. How about the second book? You can grab Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, grab them both, free to you, just pay the shipping out. All right, so let's get into it. Blake, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. So Blake Stargill is from Stargill Real Estate. He's got his own real estate company out there in LA. But, you know, I think the thing I did is when I bring a host on or a guest on to the podcast, I go to their Instagram, which I have up right here, and I scroll through. Number one, one thing I loved about Blake is he's about my height. He's got a picture right in the beginning with him and somebody else and the guy's like, I don't know, six feet taller than he is. So I felt very comfortable having him on the show because we're both about the same height. Secondarily, the real estate photos he's got up on here, they're spectacular. Now we all know real estate out in LA is pretty cool, but this stuff is next level. And we're gonna get into a little bit of that, but Blake, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, about your business, and then let's take a trip back in memory lane and talk about how you got here. Awesome. Yeah, a little bit about myself. My name is Blake Stargell, originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I'm 25 years old. I have a passion for real estate. Been in real estate for about five years now. Uh, came from, obviously, the Midwest. Made my way out to the uh, West Coast. Went to Santa Barbara City College is kind of where I first got my start. Fell in love with California in general. Um, kind of from there, realized that I, you know, I needed to make something for myself and realized that maybe college wasn't the right fit. I had some prior experience with Berkshire Hathaway in Omaha and I felt like real estate was the right place to be. So um, yeah, just in general, love real estate, love everything about it, love investment side, love helping people, love being, you know, selling people's homes. So. so Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken, the home of Warren Buffett and Berkshire there. And then from there all the way out to California. That's, amb that's ambitious. But then you made a pit stop back to Omaha, right? Or Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska. Am I saying that right? Um, right? You made a pit stop. Let's talk a little bit about that journey. So take us back five years ago on that, that, that first idea of real estate. Why real estate? Why you? And then what happened and what landed you in LA? Let's, let's let the audience get a little bit of a deeper picture of what you did and, and why you did it. For sure, yes. Yeah. So actually, we'll start right, right when I got out of high school. I was 18 years old. I had a family friend who was in real estate. He was a, a real estate broker. So kind of piqued my interest. I knew I liked sales. I had worked for Banana Republic selling credit cards in high school. So I like working with the public and I uh, thought real estate might be a good fit. So I joined Berkshire Hathaway there just on a team, kind of just doing uh, assistant work. And that's how I kind of got my feet wet with real estate. Started with Berkshire Hathaway there, really liked it, but I didn't think that Nebraska was going to be a place for me long term. So I decided, you know, how can I make my way out to the West Coast? What's a good excuse? You know, so going to college was, was, a, great, was a great stepping stone to get me out West. So uh, signed up for Santa Barbara City College, got in there, got some scholarships, thankfully. So that provided me for my way out to the West Coast. Um, once I got to Santa Barbara, I loved it, loved the school, but I partied just way too much. <laughs> and Nothing wrong with that, man. California is a good place to do that. Absolutely. And so unfortunately didn't do, do too well there, but I knew I wanted to be out there. So made my way back to the Midwest, which was very hard for me. Um, you know, just 
seeing this amazing new city with the ocean and everything. So, but I knew, I knew I needed to save up money to get out West again. So I started working from Jimmy John's actually as a delivery driver and just took anything I could. And surprisingly, it actually paid off. I was making almost 25 an hour being a delivery driver. So, uh, Started there, saved up as much as I could for about a year, and then made my way out to LA. I knew I wanted to be on the West Coast. I knew LA is an exciting market for real estate. I knew I wanted to be a real estate sales. So immediately saved up, took me about 12 months, 12 or 13 months, drove all the way up to the West Coast with a friend of mine, uh, got a nice apartment here, just situated up, shared a one bedroom apartment actually when I first got here. So uh, from there, joined Keller Williams after I got my license, which was, I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. I'm skipping over from okay. place to place. Uh, so from there, just got with Keller Williams, started taking classes there, got my real estate license. And it took me about a year after I got situated to get my license there. And I was a full-time agent from there on till now. So that's kind of how I got my start. So, you know, I, I've been to LA so many stinking times that I don't ever want to go back to LA. That's how many times I've been there. But I, I love California, but LA is not always my first place or first choice. It's, it's a very flashy place, lots to do. But man, you are in like one of the most difficult places to carve a niche as a high, like it looks like you do some high level and high end real estate. There's a lot of people fighting for that business. How, how did you from, no, from Nebraska, go out to LA and kind of make your mark and how have you had success in that market? Like what, what are the different things you've done? So if there's any realtors listening to this podcast, like what are some of the tips that you can give them? You're a young man. So like, how did you do it? Because that's tough. It's not an easy market to do that in. Yeah. I would say it's one of the most competitive real estate markets you can be in. So uh, in New York city prior to COVID, I would agree. Yeah. I mean, but to fight between New York or LA, Everybody wants to be a realtor here, especially these TV shows has made it worse. Now everybody watches <laughs> people are listing LA and they think they can be a real estate agent. So I knew that there was going to be a huge challenge getting involved. I mean, the market in Omaha is just so dramatically different than LA. Uh, but it's, I knew it was going to take hard work. And from basically when I got involved, just learned as much as I could. First got there, took as many classes as I could, signed up for as many mentorship programs, any, anything I could to get any no, uh, valuable knowledge I could. So right away, the first year was basically a learning experience. It's, you know, didn't know, have any connections out here, didn't know anybody. So the main thing was just learn as much as I could and network as much as I could for the first year, which paid off in the long run. I met some great people through with the Compass, which is now who I'm, my brokerage is under. It's Compass now. Um, met a great mentor here at Compass named Steve, Steve Sanders, who I still work with, who's a partner of mine. And he really introduced me into the luxury market, the high-end market of West Hollywood. So I'm currently partnered up with him still. Uh, we kind of do deals off and on each, with each other. And uh, the main thing was just working as hard as I could. You know, I've been, been here doing real estate full-time for over four years now. And the first two years were a big struggle. You know, it's very hard to get your start here. There's so much saturation. I think there's like a, like half a million real estate agents throughout California or something or, you know, something insane, ridiculous. So I would have never uh, guessed it was that many. <laughs> or at least have their license. So, you know, it was, it, was, it was a lot of hard work, but just networking as much as I could and making as many connections as I could. So this partnership, would you say that that was like pivotal in where your business really started to take in the turn is connecting with an experienced rep, an experienced agent that kind of had that niche? Did he have a, like a, a little niche carved in this high, the high end real estate or like, how did that happen? Like, cause you know, there's lots of real estate in LA. I mean, you can list, you know, the properties over in Compton for all, for all that, but you're doing these high end and how did you bridge that gap? Was it because of your partner? I would say, yeah, I would say the first two years I was really on my own, did a few deals here, did a lot of leases. So I got some experience under my belt and there was a, somebody in the Compass office, which was, I was intrigued to join this office, invited me over. I interviewed with Steve and kind of became his assistant at first, I would say for the first year. And now I kind of gone off my own and we were in more of a partnership at this time. So, but yeah, it was, it was a big key was joining with someone who was already in the market, who already knew everything, who already had a great clientele base and could kind of show me the ropes. So, you know, after a full year of being with him and after two years of being on my own, it took a good three years before I felt comfortable, you know, speaking and being a real agent here in Los Angeles. So, so you know, one of the things being in such a competitive market, everybody's fighting for the same deals. How are, what are you finding? Like, what would be the top three ways you're finding deals to list or, or finding, you know, your clients? What would you give, what would be that advice? 
For sure. Well, I was mainly picking up uh, clients through uh, open houses at first, through open houses, door knocking, going door to door, doing calls. I mean, I've done everything from buying numbers through Mojo Dialer to sitting two open houses every week for an entire year. Um, but now with COVID, things have changed, obviously. So you can't network as much. It's been a bit, of, I've been mainly social media based now. I pick up a lot of my clients off Instagram, off Facebook, off Twitter, things like that. So we've kind of, this past year is different in the sense that everything's mainly virtual now, all my virtual networking, calling my database, things like that. But, you know, before in a, in a normal market, I would say I pick up a lot of people through open houses, a lot of people through networking events, joining organizations here in Los Angeles that I'm involved in, charities such as Project Angel Food. I meet people through there. So uh, this year has changed the game of real estate quite a bit in, in regards to networking and meeting new clients because it's hard to have that face-to-face -face contact. Yeah, no, I think that's a big thing. And, and the funniest thing is, is, even though the environment's gotten harder, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same world where you can just go do open houses and meet people. I'm sure we'll get back there. But in this changing environment, it just seems like there's record numbers of people jumping in to be real estate agents. And you know, it's pretty typical. You've been doing this five years, but you know, I just coming from the money world, I always found these, these patterns, these conformity patterns where when, you know, when something's hot, real estate's pretty hot right now, everybody flows in. And you know, when, when something's not, everybody flows out like back in 2008, nine, 10. But it, it's almost the opposite of what I feel people should do. I feel like when the things are rough, people should be getting in because that's how you really learn and carve your teeth. Now, five years ago, so you kind of got in, you know, when things were just kind of starting to ramp up, but they were nowhere near as good as they are now. But I feel like, you know, I think you're going to have some type of a correction. Different parts of the country will be different. I, I feel there's going to be some type of a pullback. I don't yeah. see how this can be sustainable. What are your thoughts? What are, what are other agents talking about with the markets right now? I mean, do you, do you think it's going to keep going on this crazy hayride because interest rates are, are low or do you think there's going to be a pullback and is that the general consensus? I think there's going to be a bit of a pullback. Uh, I think people actually thought that was going to happen with COVID, mm -hmm. but surprisingly things actually have, you know, ramped up, like you said, quite a bit. July was actually our busiest month in recorded history at our office. So uh, that was in intriguing because for May, June, July, there was, I mean, for April, May, June, there was almost nothing going on, but I see from the office, from people that I talk to, I think a market correction is, is on its way. Maybe early next year, maybe the middle. It's very hard to predict, as you know. But uh, from everything that I've heard, things seem to be s s switching quite a bit recently. There's some, there's some red flags. So we'll see. It's really hard to write, uh, know what the market's going to do. But Yeah, and it's weird because, you know, if I interview different people, you know, a lot of people from California, you know, some, the guy I just had on said, you know, he thinks the market's going to keep going up. And then, you know, I'm hearing more people siding on your side that they think there's going to be some type of a pullback. Single digit drops, you know, some are saying double digit drops. I think commercial is going to get hit pretty good, you know, because of the, well, I mean, look at it. I mean, there's so many issues from, from riots to people just, you know, you're never going to have these businesses open back up. There's going to be massive uh, amounts of businesses closing. But for whatever it is, is it three or is it four or is it seven trillion dollars that they've printed for this stimulus package? you know, the CARES Act, I mean, that goes a long way. I'm not going to lie, like the PPP loans, the EDIL loans, the, the checks that they keep just printing and sending out. I mean, that, that definitely, I mean, you know, you look at it and you say, well, wow, how, how it's record, record months. It makes all the sense in the world. Everything's shut down for a few months, bottlenecked it. Then it opens back up, but now everybody's got all this newfound money. Plus, not only newfound money, the lowest interest rates that I can remember in my lifetime. So it's the perfect storm for this little bubble. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, only time will tell. Obviously, people thought the market was going to crash after coronavirus because everyone was, you know, in, in a really scared around, especially April and May. Um, but we'll see. Next year will be really interesting. I think that'll be a really, you know, I think we'll ride out the rest of the year pretty steady. And then next year, we'll see. So what's your game plan for next year? Let's talk a little bit about that. So if you could fast forward and kind of, I know we can't predict what's going to happen, but if you had to set up a plan for next year, what do you think your plan looks like? Uh, my plan would just be hopefully getting face to face with more people, uh, meeting as many people as I can. Doesn't matter what the market's doing. I got to really work as hard as I can, no matter what. Uh, uh, but my game plan for next year is definitely going to be, I would think coronavirus has showed me so many di different aspects of social media that I wasn't even interested in before because I've been, you know, forced to, I would say. So I think next year it's going to be a lot social media based. I picked up, I would say, 
almost 30 or 40% of my clients have been from Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Wow. That many? That many this year. Yep. This year. Holy crap. And so like, what are you doing on social media? I mean, I mean, I'm looking at your page. I mean, what have been the most successful things on Instagram? DM people, um, marketing all my properties as much as I can, doing stories, doing posts. Uh, I'm getting a lot of people from TikTok. That's not translating as much into sales. I wouldn't say it's definitely a different demographic, but uh, just posting as much as I can, putting as much marketing material as out as I can, and then DMing people who I feel are relevant. Yeah, I think that's West Hollywood. See who people who tag West Hollywood go through the pictures on the West Hollywood tags. DM all those people saying, "Hey, if you need me real estate, I'm here." So I would just say Instagram is my main focus right now, and Facebook. Yeah. I think that's incredible. And there's a lot of people using social media, but the one advantage you have being younger is you understand it and you're using it. Where a lot of the agents, maybe they're a little bit older, they're not as affluent with social media, they, they don't really know how to navigate through that. And like the one thing, it's not just about posting photos, that's part of it, it gives you credibility. But I loved what you said is you're going through and you're looking at hashtags or markets in which you're in and then you're actually engaging people organically. There's never ever going to be a thing that anyone can do marketing wise that will ever trump building relationships like that by just going right in and commenting and engaging people. People love that. I mean, social media, you know, some people are like, oh, it's, it's getting older, but no, it's still very new and people love communicating on it because it, it, I don't know why it's, you know, it's, it's way better for some people than talking on the phone. They want to just communicate yeah. via DM, which is bizarre to me, but I'm older, man. I'm 43. So I come from the world where like, you know, picking the phone up, meeting somebody out for coffee is a big thing. Today, it's all about the DM. So it's awesome that you're having that kind of success with that. Um, I want to pigeon, I want to kind of take a little bit of a, a, a pivot here, if you will. I almost said pigeonhole, but I want to take a pivot and talk about something else that you do that I find incredibly, uh, I find it amazing and probably incredibly useful in your business, but that is giving. You do a lot of stuff to give back. So let's talk a little bit about some of those. You had mentioned the one, which I'm looking here. It was, um, I think it's the, the food project. What's that called? Um, well, project Angel Food? Uh, that, yeah, that's the main charity I'm involved in. They basically do delivered meals to people with compromised immune systems for free. So different farms and things donate vegetables and they have their own kitchen, a huge kitchen. It's a huge organization in Los Angeles, actually. And basically anybody with AIDS, compromised immune systems can get meals for free delivered to their house, very sanitary and clean. So I just kind of volunteer that, whether that's cooking in the kitchen, delivering meals and vehicles or doing community events. Obviously this year it's been a lot less because all these people, I think they've actually closed down the program briefly just because of security and health, health risks. So um, haven't been able to do as much in the past six months, but that's my favorite organization to uh, volunteer in. Uh, many others though, Cedar Cyanide has a great one here at the hospital that you can volunteer with patients. I love to do that. So just giving back and it's also a way to meet, meet new people through networking. So anybody who's listening, I think getting involved with charities, you, you never know who you're gonna meet also. Not that you should look from it from an aspect of what can I get out of it, but, you know. Well, no, and, and, you know, Zig Ziglar said, you know, one of the most profound quotes, he said, if you help enough people get what they want, you will get what you want. So if you go into, you know, charitable giving or you go into helping, you know, in, in things like Project Angel Food or any other charity, if you go in with the idea of truly giving back and helping, solving other people's problems, you're going to have massive success. But if you go into it as a method of, you know, you say, oh, I want to help, but you're going to help because you want to meet new people that will serve you. That's the wrong attitude. You got to go in with giving first. That's the only way to do it. And when you do that, the, plus it's a universal law. I mean, you, it just comes back to you. And, and yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure it's come back to you in tremendous ways. I'm sure you've found listings, got listings out of that, but you didn't go asking for it. You just go there, you do your thing, you, you put your best foot forward. And because of that, people take note, they ask what you do. And then once you tell them, oh, I was thinking about, you know, buying a new house or listing a house. And it's so natural, but that's the way it works, folks. So what other, like in LA, what other uh, like charities do you take part in outside of, um, you know, Project Angel Food? But what other ones would you suggest people look up? Oh, uh, yeah, we do a lot through Compass. Uh, we have Compass Cares program in my company, actually. Uh, this is a brokerage I'm under. We do a ton of volunteering events here throughout the community with homeless shelters. There's the LGBTU center, which I volunteer out as well. 
um, that we do through Compass. A lot of five mile, 5K run walks, things like that. There's one in Santa Monica we always do, but a lot of things through Compass, through my company is another way that I volunteer. So those are my three, Cedar Cyanide, Project Angel Food, and then Compass Cares through my company as well, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners have a lot of company programs as well that maybe they haven't explored. Yeah, no, I think everybody should get, you know, involved in that and really, really take part in any charities you can to try to give back. And giving back doesn't mean you have to donate money. Maybe you don't have the money. Go donate your time. Okay, help somebody, you know, like, like people that have compromised immune systems that can't go to the grocery store, that can't go out and do the things that you can do, help them. You know, and, and that is the act of giving and it will dramatically change your life if you spend time doing that. Now, in your journey that you've had, and I know it's only been a a five-year journey, but what would you say is the biggest internal obstacle that you've faced on this journey? Uh, Biggest internal obstacle is like believing in myself, I would think. Like you said, coming into the biggest competitive market from Nebraska was a huge mental hurdle for me to get over, knowing that it was going to take time because I think that I've struggled with instant gratification, which a lot of people from my generation sometimes tend to as well, thinking that everything's going to come quick. Uh, and real estate is a long-term play, whether you're looking at from an investment side or you're looking at from a broker selling side, it takes a while. It takes, well, it's, it's a snowball effect is what I would call it. You know, the more people you meet, the more people they refer, the more people, you know, the more your circle grows. So I think the biggest hurdle, me, hurdle was just to mentally realize that it's going to take three, four years before things are really going to start getting rolling. So that's no, my I'm- I'm glad you brought that up. Like, you know, the, the younger generation with that instant gratification and then you get into a thing where it does, it's just, you got to keep putting the time in and it seems like you're never going to get there, but then all of a sudden it explodes and then it explodes again and it will continue to keep doing that. So that's internal. What about external obstacles? LA has tons of external obstacles. What has been your biggest external obstacle you've had to face? Uh, financially, getting, getting secured at first year. We know when I first moved here, when I was getting my license, I got a job at Whole Foods just to support myself at first. So I think financially figuring out how I was going to be stable here for a long enough time to make it in real estate to where I could start being a full-time real estate agent, paying all my bills. So externally, that was my biggest factor. Something I was worried about constantly is how am I going to pay the bills at first, especially moving to a new city, not knowing anyone, but you know, things just tend to work out when you, when you go for it, you know, you don't see opportunities until they really come to you. So got this great opportunity to work at Whole Foods, which, you know, was a perfect starter job when I was here and, and segued me into getting my license and being a full-time agent. Fantastic. So if you could just give one piece of advice to new agents entering the real estate world now, what would, what would be the one piece of advice you can give? Uh, work hard. Uh, I think that there's so many things that you see online of different ways to skate or skate around that and not realize that. But it took me, I would think, a good year and a half before I fully realized like to make it in real estate is how hard you work. I mean, unless you were born in Beverly Hills and you have family that lives in mansions that are going to give you these listings. Otherwise, you're going to have to work really hard because you might get lucky once or twice. But if you're looking to develop a long term career with long term success, you need a big database. You need to work hard and, and people People will recognize that. They'll, they'll see your hard work. Well said. All right, man. So as we end the final thing, how do people find you? I, I mean, clearly Instagram, but is that the best source? Where, where would you like people to find you to see what you're doing if they want to kind of follow the life of an LA realtor through the journeys? Like, what would be the best place? Yeah, my Instagram, Blake Stargell. Uh, my name, B-L-A-K-S-T-A-R-G-E-L. And uh, TikTok as well. I'm big on TikTok, so I love doing that. I love posting home videos and some real, t- real estate tips on there. So Instagram, TikTok is my name as well, or uh, Facebook. Awesome. So it's all social media. And folks, when you do go on his Instagram, scroll down. It's like 10, 10 or 12 swipes. There is this one house that he's got a photo of, unlike anything I've seen. And I watch those shows, but it is just spectacular. It's teak wood. What is it made out of teak? And what's the other wood there? Without me looking at it, it, it's all right. You guys got to check this photo. Here it is. So it's um, just stunning. I I mean, redwood and teak, that's what it was. And you guys got to see this house because there's no houses like that here in New York. That's a LA special, but uh, just giving you guys some reasons to go check out that Instagram page. That photo is worth it all in itself. And he's got a bunch of other stuff there. So guys, make sure you check out Blake's Instagram, follow him on TikTok and Facebook. And for all of you, like I said earlier, the whole thing to becoming a rebel banker that you guys have to do is take action. 
I gave you two free books. Now what your job is to do is to go click the button, find the free book link and actually take action and get the book. Now, when you get the book, you should probably read it too. That might help a little bit, but I'm just trying to get you to see that knowledge isn't enough anymore. Okay. You might think going on watching podcasts, you know, gathering knowledge is enough. It's not. You have to actually take action. Blake's a perfect example. You got to put the time in, you got to put the hustle in and you got to work hard. So folks on your journey to becoming a rebel banker, get it done and take action. So I love, I love that you say that because I just, there's just so much information out there and it's just, it becomes overwhelming. You could just, you spend all your time looking at different information and different videos without doing anything. And I, yeah, I think that's such a good point. I, and that's why, you know, it's like, I love TikTok, you know, and I love Instagram, but you do get lost, right? You just start watching the videos and all of a sudden an hour went by. I always try to find something on one of those two sites that gets me to YouTube and then I'll watch a video on YouTube. And what I have a habit of doing is I, I'm just a paper and pen guy. I'll grab a pad of paper when I watch a YouTube video and I'll just go through and write my favorite things about that YouTube video. And then I'll translate that back into what I do. I can't tell you how many trainings I come up with by doing it that way. Find something that motivates me, then I spin it. And then I just try to motivate others with that. So folks try those things. It makes a massive difference. Great. Thank you for having me. I really, yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah, really? It was an honor. Yeah. And keep up the good work, keep working hard and, uh, you know, make sure you prepare for what you think's coming here. And I'm sure we'll all make it through this just fine, but I'm sure people that put the time in and are ready for it are going to make it through even better. So thanks, thanks Blake. Those two books. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, folks. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the real estate money school. We'll see you on the next episode.